So thank you for the invite. And if you were expecting to see a talk today on um, rapid test, the two-year manifesto, then you are definitely at the right um, place. So as I say, the title of my talk today is two-year manifesto. And I, I really sort of want to sort of subtitle this um, having an impact for me. Um, whether we're doing future blood testing, you know, we have an impact by really getting it into the hands of patients and clinicians. And so ultimately, everything I want to talk about today is just really funneling everything down to say, actually, you know, at least how do I think we can get this um, onto the um, market? So the um, I will just discuss ZP's, um, let's say, role or interest in the future blood testing network, which are our, our hosts today. I'll also talk um, slightly about wearables. I think that even I was at a, a Future Blood Network event um, just at the end of 2023, and there that actually they were starting to sponsor kind of wearables or continuous um, measurement technologies, and that's something we're interested in as well. So I can see that the the sort of brief at Future Blood um, Testing Network has kind of broadened slightly from not just being blood testing necessarily, but also into wearables as well. So I will discuss that. I will discuss point of care diagnostics for me. Um, Point of care diagnostics often does mean um, blood testing. I think the glucose strip is the kind of um, grandfather of um, of blood testing at home. Let's say, just when I say breaking news, it won't be in this order. But the NHS have also recently done some announcements on wearables, so I thought I would just kind of comment upon that as I go through, and then to really to this two-year manifesto of really how can one have an impact if one's going to do research on blood testing, how can you actually make an impact? Um, so I took this from the from the um, Future Blood Testing Network um, just a couple of days ago, and I just wanted to kind of pick up on on, let's say, the mission statement um, that I that I saw there. So it's, you know, it's digital health technologies, but then there's a series of words, which is, you know, remote um, testing, rapid testing, affordable testing, um, inclusivity, which I will comment upon when it comes to things like glucose monitoring and also personalized analytics. So personalized analytics kind of suggests um, connection to the cloud. So I've taken the kind of the brief that the Future Blood Testing Network has given itself and I will weave this brief into um, my talk today and how um, ZP is also very aligned with this because this is something that I think we were always intending. Well, this is what we, you know, we also believe in at ZP. That's why the Future Blood Testing Network is kind of interesting to us. And then, I, as I say, the kind of what I want to go with, with this is actually how to have an impact if we're going to do all this research, how to actually make it um, impactful to the, let's say, to the world um, outside. So a couple of things I'm going to pick up on today are um, point of care testing. This is a kind of point of care um, type device um, that I will um, comment on today. And then also wearables as well, which um, was also something I will um, comment on today. And these are sort of two technologies um, that we have at um, ZP. I might just change just quickly and just say I do have these technologies with me today. Um, this is that kind of point of care device. And I also have a couple of um, wearable watches here with um, micro needles on them. So I will um, discuss those today. So it won't just be me talking. I'll, I'll do some demonstrations um, in a bit as well. Um, so when it comes to wearables, I just want to kind of, um, you may have heard this in the last, I think literally the last couple of days that the NHS is talking about the artificial pancreas. Um, now this is something that is over 15 years. Um, you know, I first kind of came across this in, in a conference called the diabetes technology meeting that happens every year in um, Maryland, um, USA. And what the NHS is talking about. I just took these screenshots so I can see here that they're uh, when they talk about the artificial pancreas. So I'll define it in a minute. But there's two elements. There's, well, there's three elements to it. There's a um, a pump element, I think, from the NHS websites that they're using um, a device called the mini med from Medtronic, which I was a bit surprised. Um, I can only I, I think it is because I've actually, you know, I've aware of that technology and I look at the it, um, look at the illustration and it seems to be the mini med from Medtronic and then also I think that I um, they're using the CGM um, the um, from Abbott I was a bit surprised because they're two different um, companies so maybe I've got that slightly wrong but I do know one thing about this that the NHS is now promoting the fact that it'll be giving type 1 diabetics the opportunity to have this um, this artificial pancreas, 
which is really a CGM um, worn on the um, arm. Um, I've got, as I say, I've got um, some of this technology with me now, and I'm actually just, um, uh, this is one, this is, so when, when they talk about the CGM, this is the Abbott Freestyle Libre 2. Um, this is a device that um, penetrates the skin. There's a little sensor, which you won't be able to see on this small camera. There's a little sensor here that goes through the skin. It's a transdermal glucose sensor. Um, and that's something that's very kind of close to our heart, um, let's say at, at um, ZP. So um, when the um, when the NHS talks about the artificial pancreas, they are talking about these kind of CGMs that get worn on the arm. Um, and then they're also talking about an insulin pump. So I said that Medtronic had a product called the Mini Meds, and it seems to me that they may be using the Medtronic um, pump, but I may have got the pump bit wrong. Um, I was just looking at the images. And what they're doing then is, is sort of um, tying these two pieces of technology together using an algorithm and by sort of dosing the insulin based on the glucose measurements, then I think it improves long-term outcomes for um, type one diabetics because they have better glycemic control. Um, and I suppose in the end, you know, the obviously, well, not obviously, but you know, it's meant to save the NHS uh, money because type one diabetics have um, less complications. I also think there's a, there's a certain um, safety aspect to this as well, because um, people are less likely to overdose necessarily with insulin. Anyway, so the reason I brought that up is because it was breaking news. It is relevant to the um, to the Future Bloods testing network, um, because I feel like they've slightly expanded their, their um, away from just testing blood to actually doing wearables as well. And it is relevant, or it is precedence, because um, the NHS is also getting into it. As I say at ZP, we're also interested in wearable um, sensors. Um, so I might just do a quick um, change of um, camera for a second here, just because um, this is the Abbott Freestyle Libre 2. I'd kind of, this is the sort of product. Abbott first acquired this guy IP around about 2000. So you can understand now we're in 2023. So you can understand how long this kind of technology, even for a large company like Abbott, um, can take to sort of bring to the market. So. This is their CGM. This is that. This is the Freestyle Libre Two. You do see this people wearing it these days, uh, because they're obviously interested in expanding into the sort of wellness market. At ZP, we tend to work on a kind of next generation of product. This is a a watch, um, and on the back of this watch, there's um, this um, piece. And what this is is actually a micro needle array. So it's rather than um, it's less intrusive let's say, than a classical CGM. A classical uh, continuous glucose monitor has a filament that comes out the back of this sensor. It's about seven millimeters long. It goes into the interstitial fluid and continually monitors the glucose. And the NHS will be using this kind of technology now to control those pumps. That's the artificial pancreas. But we also see that there'll probably be a new generation of um, this kind of CGM, continuous glucose uh, monitoring technology coming along, but it'll be more in this kind of micro needle um, array, which is um, probably more broadly applicable than the CGM um, currently on the market. But just to say that Z, um, at ZP, we also have an interest um, in CGM as well. And that's one of the technologies that we work with with our um, partners. So that was the technology that I um, just showed um, on my screen um, just a minute ago. That watch strap's quite useful because when it tightens around the wrist, it basically pulls these little micro needles into the interstitial fluid. The micro needles are less than one millimeter um, long, so you you don't feel any pain. Um, I've also put on these these Abbott technologies as well. I don't find these particularly painful, but for if you've got a smaller arm, I could understand there that they actually can be quite um, a little bit painful. And I think one of the one of the sort of problems with the incumbent CGMs is that the applicators are quite a large lump of plastic and so i can see that kind of at the you know i can see that being a problem in the future when, as people become more sort of sustain more interested in sustainability the idea that the applic the, the glucose sensors themselves are intrinsically small but the applicator that you use to apply them can be actually quite large um i do have an agenda today which is the two-year manifesto so i will get to it but i'm just giving a bit of a background as to what things that are happening you know, even in our society in the last um, couple of days. Um, at ZP, um, when you look at the um, the remit of the future blood testing network, you know, they are very interested in these keywords, which is remote, sort of rapid, 
um, affordable, inclusive and personalised. So I think you, for me, you can't really get more, um, let's say, um, you, you, you can't get more sort of um, low cost and, and um, rapid um, than actually a sort of traditional um, glucose sensor. So I do have one of those traditional glucose um, sensors here. I think the traditional glucose sensor 100% fulfills the remit of the future um, blood test network. And it's also a good illustrator for the kind of um, technology that we like at um, Zimmer and Peacock, because we, we generally do believe in the idea, and I'll just get my blood here. Um, we generally believe in this idea that, you know, you should be able to make rapid diagnostics for testing blood and people should be able to do it at home. And the nice thing is that, you know, that technology is already kind of demonstrated. So let's just have a quick look. So I've got 88 megs per DL, um, 88 megs per um, deciliter. I think you kind of, um, you know, you're meant to have 90 megs per DL. I'm a little bit hungry because we're near lunch and I haven't had my lunch yet. So I'm a little bit um, below. But the reason I brought that up was because at ZP, um, actually all the technologies that we're really interested in and, the, and, and we really exploit um, are um, actually, um, we, 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 we tend to use um, electrochemistry, which both those that CGM um, and the, the continuous glucose monitor and the blood glucose meter that I just showed um, are both um, CGM um, sensors. So why is there a ZP? Um, um, and so what's our interest? So I, I'll bring this, this slide back up and say, you know, why is there a ZP? Because we actually, we are generally interested in the remit of the future um, blood testing network. And that remit being um, remote, rapid, affordable and inclusive and personalized analytics. But then we also want to have impact as well. So, you know, we want we want the remit of the future blood network or blood testing network to go further and actually have, you know, let's say real world um, application. And that's what at ZP we're super interested in. So this is why we've got this kind of two year um, sort of manifesto um, running, which is what we say to really our clients and collaborators, which is um, we want people to get to market much quicker than they would have traditionally thought possible. Um, I'll describe the typical kind of um, roadmap for a, for a company or a startup company and what happens um, with a couple of slides now. But at ZP, we do have you know technologies that we describe as as platforms. So these are technologies that we use with our collaborators. So it, people don't have to run ZP assays or ZP sensors upon, on top of this. And I will describe it and I will demo this in a bit, but these are really similar to actually glucose meters and they happen to be electrochemistry as well. And they offer um, remote and rapid testing. We use um, a technology or manufacturing technology called thick film printing or screen printing that definitely offers affordability. And the uh, future um, uh, blood testing networks also very interested in the kind of rapid analytics. So we definitely have now, I know some of you, uh, if you've got your smartphones up, there'll be a few QR codes in a bit because um, the analytics part of this, we actually have the apps already on the um, Android store and also on the app store, the um, the app store as well. And what we're actually doing is when we're doing this kind of testing, then I'll do a demo in a bit. We're actually sending the data to the cloud in real time. Um, and that we also have what's called an API, an application program interface. So when people talk about analytics on, let's say, patients, often what that means is, you know, you have to, well, not have to, but you should potentially put the data into the cloud. We can talk about um, um, security on that. Um, but for us, we, we don't need patients' names and addresses and ages in order to put the data up into the cloud. We can um, anonymize it. Um, so... Um, we're very interested in the actual putting of data, putting of data um, into that um, into that cloud. I'm going to describe the typical sort of um, pathway for somebody who was trying to have an impact and actually trying to get some of this technology um, out onto the market. They're really what they're working on a lot is the technology readiness level. So people will talk about um, TRL levels. Um, you know, you've got your basic principles when somebody sort of has a first idea. You've got your technology concept. Um, and I think a lot of um, if I'm reading an academic paper and it's full of like raw data and raw signals, then we're really getting to a sort of proof of concept. And then if 
somebody's doing some testing in the lab, then we're really getting to a technology, you know, validation in the lab. So the, with that sort of TRL one to four, and then you're starting to test in a relevant environment. So you may do a few patients in a clinic that's really bringing you to TRL um, five. Um, maybe if you do a larger study, you'll get into TRL six. Um, if you're kind of turning it into a more of a sort of um, prototype, then you'll get into TRL seven, eight, and then finally nine when you're actually deploying it. So this journey for um, medical diagnostics starts often in academia and then eventually moves into startups and hopefully moves into the company and the company then tries to mature it to something like a technology readiness level number nine. Now, this, the cost or the spend in order to come up these technology readiness levels is not sort of linear. The further you get from the lab and the closer you get to um, market readiness and the closer you get to actually um, regulatory approval, the more money there's actually spent. Um, now, if you look at somebody's business plan, they'll often say, OK, well, you know, it will take me five years to get to um, get this onto the markets, get some sort of clinical um, approval. In reality, it, it always takes them more than five years and it can actually take 10 to 15 years, um, at which point then um, the sad truth is that people do, you know, after 10 to 15 years of, of effort, sometimes like a third of their career or half a career, only 10 percent of companies um, are possibly successful. So there's a sort of 90 percent attrition rate. And this was something that uh, when we when we founded ZP, we kind of from the very start realized that this was what was going on. Um, so we were very keen on actually um, speeding this process up. So we want to reduce this 10 to 15 years down to more like two years. Um, now, how do you do that? Well, you have to look at the technology readiness levels and you have to say, you know, if everyone's following the same linear path, um, then that linear path is already shown to be 10 to 15 years of effort at the end of which only a 10 percent you know, success rate, let's say. So we have to be able to we have to cut away a lot of this. And that's what we're trying to do with our technology platform. We're trying to say, look, you know, basic principles, um, technology development, proof of concept, the hardware and the technology platform that we're developing does leave pieces of work that need to take place. But the hardware that we have, and when I say the hardware that we have, I'll just sort of, like I said, I'm going to, um, I'll demonstrate in a minute, but I will be talking about the hardware platform that we have, the, the electrodes that we have, the apps that we have on the, um, on the app store. These are all really designed to cut away a lot of this, these sort of barriers of technology readiness levels and actually just leave people with the parts that really add value. And what I mean by that is if you're developing a technology, your know, technology involves, hard, um, involves hardware and a bioassay, it's actually the bioassay where the real value is. You can always get hardware made, um, but people do kind of become quite myopic and work on the hardware quite a lot, but actually forget about the assay. It's all really in the assay is where the real value add is. So we don't deny that actually, even if ZP has a kind of a technology stack, as we describe it, and we think that this can actually cut away a lot of um, things that otherwise would be on people's um, roadmaps, we, just, we, we still understand that we have to leave that there are pieces of work that still have to be, um, be done by the entrepreneur or by the academic, which includes proof of concept. They have to do some sort of validation in their lab. They probably have to start testing it on the real world and they probably have to demonstrate it um, in a clinical setting as well. But what the way we've built our platform, it actually it, it, it has the hardware um, built in and also a lot of the manufacturing built in. There's just a final piece, which is actually converting screen printed electrodes. And what I mean by screen printed electrodes, if I hold that up to my camera, those have to be converted into some sort of biosensor, which means enzymes, antibodies, aptamers. Um, these are the kind of functionalizations that um, have to be uh, have to take place. There's also a nice thing about the platform as well is actually um, is really deployment. It's one of the um, keywords behind the future blood testing network is actually um, inclusivity and inclusivity means um, you know if you're going to include people you have to be able to get it out to people and so at ZP if people are on our platform it means that if they have a client or a sale let's say effectively we can actually receive that order 
put it in a box and ship it then to the actual client. So that's a bit like um, Amazon's order fulfillment, except ZP is doing this um, for our clients. So as long as they're on our platform, then it's quite easy. To, it's easier for us to A, get them to market and B, actually to do that order fulfillment um, as well. The question you might ask is, you know, why are we so obsessed with basically um, kind of reducing this 10 to 15 years down to two years? And the, and the secret is because there's a really big problem when you've got a new technology. Um, this is the kind of um, life cycle for any kind of product. So <clears throat> in the early days, you'll find technology enthusiasts. So let's say you were an academic and you've, you've, you've partnered up with a, a clinician. That, that clinician is probably an enthusiast. And now that clinician might have a slightly larger network, which would include some visionaries. But then there's actually the, the most people in, in, in markets can actually be quite pragmatists. And pragmatists are people who are really saying, OK, well, it sounds, it sounds interesting, but I'll, I'll wait till I buy into this until I've really heard from the visionaries. And then you've got the conservatives who are kind of um, less. They're really going to they're not going to start buying or adopting a technology until the pragmatists have um, really validated this. And then you've got the skeptics, people who are not going to change. They're always going to continue doing what they want to do. So our obsession with actually trying to accelerate all timelines is because there's actually something called the chasm. Um, it's with any technology um, introduction, you will find um, enthusiasts and visionaries who really buy into it. But there's a really there's a time gap between um, the visionary and the pragmatist. And we un as EP understand that gap. So what we are, a understand it exists and B, we understand that you have to kind of get to that gap as quickly as possible. So if you send 10 to 15 years, by the time you discover this gap between the visionary and the pragmatist, you're you're completely out of money and your your sort of investors um, are ready to sort of move on a little bit. So we, you know, you must understand that some of the barriers to get into market, or m actually a lot of the barriers to get to market are not at all what you imagine. It's not science and engineering, it's actually adoption. Um, and there's a there's a human sort of um, element, you know, to everything in life. But one of the human elements is actually this conservatism between the visionaries and the pragmatists. And you have to recognize this early on. You can overcome it by showing them technologies earlier and earlier on and getting them um, practiced. But if you have to come up all this technology readiness levels um, linearly on your own, then it can take too long. And when you do get there, you run out of money to be able to deal with this um, with this gap between the visionaries and the pragmatists. And the pragmatists need a certain amount of time to get familiar with the technology before they will start adopting it. So that's why we've introduced the Sensi All platform. Um, I think the Sensi All platform is really an interesting fit Steve, because the future blood testing network what they're trying to do is exactly what we were trying to do when we when we started out um, inclusivity is one of those key words so inclusivity for me also means availability so the hardware platform that i'm talking today about today is actually driven by an app that's available on the google um, play store and it's also um, available on the um, on the apple app store um, so we're dealing with kind of most, um, at least the two biggest operating systems um, currently um, out there. Now, when somebody's actually installed this um, app on their on their phone, um, and I'll do a um, a bit of a demo in a bit. Um, it, it next question it asks you is, can you show me a new uh, QR code? And so these QR codes that we have here, each one of these is a, either a different assay or a different analyte, and they all um, so the, the name Sensi all really means something because actually we can keep on adding QR codes. And so the app is perfectly capable of running all sorts of sensors, all sorts of assays and, on, and all sorts of analytes, medical ones that are, that are relevant. You know, for example, pH of blood is a relevant and um, relevant test and analytes. Glucose is definitely irrelevant. Uh, sorry, is definitely relevant. Potassium is definitely relevant. For example, there are definitely companies working at at home testing of potassium so that they can triage people into dialysis. Um, now at ZP, our business model is actually just to support other people. So in fact, we have a QR code here that's basically generic and it allows people to come up with their own brand, their own sensor, their own assay, um, i.e. their own science and engineering. So that QR code, if you later on watch this on YouTube, you'll be able to find out that when you um, 
when you scan that QR code, it essentially gives you a, a blank canvas, which is for you to edit and turn into your app. So those different QR codes will actually allow the app to um, run different uh, analytes and different tests just by scanning, as I say, the um, QR code. Um, something that's not a keyword, or well, in fact, it is a keyword on the future blood testing network is actually affordability. Biggest thing that people actually sometimes um, overlook is actually the affordability part. Everyone says, oh, it's going to be low cost. Uh, but um, at ZP, we actually do use a low cost um, platform for making those sensors. We do use screen printing. That demonstration of the glucose strip that I gave earlier on, that's using um, that technology is often a screen printed electrode and, the, you know, a, a glucose strip probably cost the manufacturer something like five cents to make. So affordability is intrinsic to the glucose strip and at ZP we are using that kind of technology. It's also quite reliable. I mean, that kind of technology now has been around for 40 years. Now at ZP we understand that nobody needs another glucose strip, but people potentially would, for example, need a potassium strip for measuring um, dialysis patients. That would be like a, you know an, an obvious next application. Um, so the hardware that we have is, is this particular hardware here. It's about the size of my hand. As I say, I'll do a quick um, demonstration in a bit. But this is a very sort of generic piece of hardware. And I'll describe what I mean by that sort of um, that um, in a bit. What I mean generic is the technology that we like to use at Zimmer and Peacock is electrochemistry. In the UK, there are actually a lot of um, analytical development work going on. And there are quite a lot of groups doing um, electroanalytical chemistry. So um, I know there's groups at Reading um, that are doing electroanalytical chemistry. I know there are groups at Southampton, for example, that are doing um, electroanalytical chemistry. So the techniques that those um, colleagues would be using, in, at least in academia, would be amperometry, potentiometry, voltammetry, impedance spectroscopy. So the sensor all platform will actually do all of these. So it's a very functional scientific instrument. It's just when you want to get deploy this to clinicians, that's why we have the apps, because clinicians do not want to see current versus time or voltage versus time or the impedance um, versus binding. They just want a result. And that's what the Sense It All app actually does. Um, so in terms of um, in terms of hardware, we have sensors, we have the hardware itself. We have the app. So if you follow this video later on on YouTube, you'll actually be able to put that app onto your phone. But it will be, I wouldn't say useless, but it's not so useful if you don't have the hardware to make the Bluetooth connection. But um, we also have a cloud system as well. So um, every time a test is done, the data goes to the cloud. Now, we make sure that we don't get the patient ID because obviously we don't, well, you know, you don't want to, we don't want to be putting personal information in the cloud. But the kind of data that we put up in the cloud, in fact, I'll show you in a minute the kind of data we put up in the cloud. So the way the technology works is the sensor goes into the meter, the sample goes onto the sensor, the app, through the QR code, the app knows what to do and it tells the meter what to do and the meter gives the data back to the app. And just FYI, the data actually goes up to the cloud as well, which is really useful in clinical trials, for example, because people are not scrambling around looking for the raw signal. We actually know where the raw signal is. It's in the cloud. Um, and we also give a result on the phone as well. So a clinician doesn't want to see raw data. They actually just want the result. Um, and, but here I've just got a quick animation. So we actually put the entire raw signal up into the cloud, which when you're coming off, like when you're at technology le readiness level six and seven, you would like to actually make sure that everything is working correctly. And one of the best ways of knowing whether something is working correctly is actually to see the um, the raw data. And so, we do actually store everything like that up in the cloud, and it also allows us then to share it with us, with ourselves at least internally. And um, with that, we don't have to send the data. It's it's actually in a cloud system called um, Julie. Um, we also have API built into it as well. So at the blood, um, at the Future Blood Testing Network, they are interested in analytics. Everyone in the world is interested in analytics, and the thing that makes most of the modern world actually operate when you buy something, when you buy a ticket, when you board a flight, etc. It's APIs, application program interfaces that are communicating between cloud systems and sort of um, allow. And so the API is really the thing that will send the sort of data 
probably to a healthcare system where actually it can then be put with the patient records and um, you know, it can be interpreted in the context of the of the patient's history. Um, I said here I'll do a quick um, demonstration, so I will um, do that. Um, so you can see my um, screen in front of me, there's my hand. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'll take one of these screen printed um, electrodes, I'll mount it in the device, um, I click that up. So now I've made a, essentially made electrical contact with it. I'm going to bring a little sample in. Um, in so I've just got a little sample here. Um, it's not so much the analyte that I'm interested in. I'm more interested in just showing you the workflow. Um, so I'll just bring the nice thing about electrochemical sensors. This is quite a large sample. I'm actually putting 50 microliters on here, so that's quite large for us in our world. Um, but I just put that sample on like that. Um, so you know, essentially something like a drop of blood, though a, a real glucose strip only needs 300 nanoliters worth of sample. I'll go to the assay on the app. The clinicians don't want to necessarily run, you know, scientific software. They just want, you know, a few buttons and um, click. And the also thing that they want is, well, in fact, this this really fits well with the um, with what they're what, what the future blood testing network is about is is rapid. I mean, at, at ZP, we I do try to make sure that we only develop assays that are kind of two minutes or less. Um, you know, and it, ideally, I'd like it to be five seconds. So when, when I was doing that demonstration earlier on, these glucose meters, they're very mature technology these days. You know, they run their, their assays in five seconds. But that assay ran, runs in about 60 seconds, and then the clinician will get the results on the phone. Um, in this case, it's not it's not a serious test, it, but the parts per million, the PPM was 274. Um, now, I use that to kind of illustrate that workflow but what it does what it does show you is that and in fact at this point when i it says upload complete so in fact the data has actually gone to the cloud the whole raw signal and then i can hit done so it is remote i can do um in fact you know i have this going all the time people are testing in india the data is going to the cloud it's rapid do try to make our assays less than two minutes it's affordable so for example we're using these test strips commercially they're two euros fifty each, and that's at low volume. So I would say that inclusive is a, is a, you know, in, in, what I would say about inclusivity is this: that there are very very large companies in the world who manufacture technologies like this, and they're trying to use the LEDs on the backs of these watches. The problem with the, with that is that they're actually very befuddled, if I if that's the right term for it, by skin tone. So the kind of technologies that we're interested in, which is using micro needles. Have a higher degree of inclusivity because skin color is not actually um, doesn't affect the signal, and then the personalized analytics are sort of baked into this um, because um, we're basically putting the data in the cloud. So we see us as a conduit of data, but then I see actually other companies and well not other companies yeah other companies and clinicians are actually contextualizing that data and actually turning it into useful information then um, for the actual. Um, let's say, the, the actual um, patients. So if I was to um, summarize um, at ZP, so I appreciate the um, Future Blood Testing Network inviting us today. And at ZP, the key words that the Future Blood work, net, Network use are, it's you know remote, rapid, affordable, inclusive, and personalized analytics. And you can see at ZP that we've actually built um, a platform that was re was really built with that um, actually in mind, because I was trying to solve a commercial problem, which was too many companies spent too much money and too much time and weren't successful in actually getting to the market. And so now when I say that we have a two year manifesto, it's because I think that there are plenty of problems to be solved in this world. And if I can just persuade a few companies and a few academics to adopt our platform, then many of them will actually get to the market and hit the last thing that I want, which is actually to have a, a real world um, impact. So I think um, with that, I just want to say um, thank you very much. I appreciate that was um, fairly quick, but I'm happy to take any questions because um, I also do have a hard stop as well. So I'm sure many of you, um, like many of you, actually, I um, also have um, a um, some meetings as well. So thank you very much for having um, having me this afternoon and any questions I'd be happy to answer them now. So thanks so much.